Hello, everyone. Peter Melton back with you, joined again by the good doctor, Guy McPherson. And I have to tell you what an honor and joy it's been to spend the last 12 days with Guy and really sink into the depth of, of what this topic's all about and what it brings up in people, but also to dig into the depth of what's it like to be you? You know, it's as you begin to hear about this message and feel into this message, there's always the wonder, do I want to share it with other people? Uh, can I tell the kids? Wow, this is really terrible news, but it feels like it's important. And so it, it would be great to understand from the beginning, when you first got into climate through, when you dared to give your start writing and putting it out publicly and tell us the story of, of Guy McPherson. Yeah, well, it's been a pleasure to spend time with you as well, Peter. Thank you. Um, I, I was studying climate science as part of my graduate research when I was in graduate school 30 years ago uh, because it was loosely connected to the ecological field research I was conducting. And so for 30 years I checked in off and on doing climate work and then I was editing a book in 2002, published in 2003, editing with a, another colleague of mine. and. I came to the conclusion at that point that we had triggered events on the climate change front that would lead to our extinction in the not very distant future. And I mourned, as you can imagine, for quite a long time, and almost nobody noticed. And among the few people who noticed, I, I received this sort of pushback that my mother, my grandmother is dying, and this is horrible, and it's very personal, and here you are focusing on this ethereal loss of all humans that I can't really connect with. And, and so even the people who recognized that I was in pain couldn't have a conversation in which we didn't talk past each other. I couldn't really understand why this person was grieving their, their 84-year-old grandmother who was about to die. They had a full life, after all. And, of course, nobody gets out alive. And then, and then here's me, and they can't understand why I'm even focusing on this, this anticipatory grief that anticipates not just the death of one, but the death of many. And I, I was reminded then, and I'm reminded now, of, a, of an episode of the original version of Star Trek. And Leonard Nimoy plays Spock, the, the ultimate rationalist apparently incapable of having emotions and and has never never exhibited emotions during the course of the show and then on screen a Vulcan ship he was a Vulcan and a Vulcan ship is blown up and something like 300 of members of his species died instantly and and he sheds a tear or shows us some other makes some other tremendous expression of pain of grieving of mourning and the people look at him and go what you didn't even know those people. You know, the humans were, were so into the individual life and incapable of understanding how he could mourn the loss of people he didn't know. And he made some comment to that effect. You know, you mourn the loss of one person you're close to. These are 300 of my species that I lost in a flash. And so again, uh, you know, talking past each other mm -hmm. is one of the things we do best in this culture. And so that was 2002, I reached that conclusion. A year or so later, I discovered the concept of global peak oil and believed that collapse of industrial civilization would occur worldwide rapidly enough that it would prevent runaway climate change from causing our extinction. But in the interim, we've discovered the 40-year lag between carbon dioxide emissions and temperature rise. We've discovered 38 seemingly irreversible self-reinforcing feedback loops or positive feedbacks on the climate front. We've discovered that methane is bubbling out of the Arctic Ocean at an increasingly rapid rate. And all of these things indicate to me that we've triggered runaway climate change. It's not merely abrupt climate change, it's runaway climate change, and it's too late. If collapse of industrial civilization happens today, we still have those events going on. We have the 40, last 40, approximately 40 years of carbon dioxide emissions that haven't been realized yet. Right. They're baked into the cake. We've still fired the clathrate gun right. in the Arctic Ocean and so on. And so again, I'm back to grieving. Right, but right, and this was still at that 2003, 2000? Well, 
for a long time I thought we had we had dodged the bullet. It was from 2003, early 2004, up until the middle of 2012. Right, because that's actually. when you set up the homestead. So walk well, us I, through I, the timeline a little right. more there. So, so I began setting up the homestead, committed to the homestead in August or September of 2007. Moved to the homestead, left my high pay, no work university job um, in 2009, May 1st, 2009, 20 years to the day after I started there. And one of the reasons I left was to spend full time working on the homestead and, and give me and some of the people I loved an opportunity to get through the collapse of industrial civilization. Well, since then even, since May 2009, we have discovered in the scientific community the, the methane bubbling out of the Arctic Ocean at an increasing rate and all these self-reinforcing feedback loops and also the 40-year lag right. on, the, so on the When did you start dioxide. writing? The, 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 give us the feeling of what it was to decide to be a messenger as opposed to just someone who sensed it for yourself and acted for yourself. Well, I, I started writing pretty widely and speaking pretty widely in August 2007, but I didn't realize at that point that we triggered runaway climate change. And so I only re-realized that in June of 2012. So it's been just within the last two and a half years or so that I realized again that we're screwed again, or still, or however you want to put that. And it's been a, a very lonely experience uh, relaying a lonely message. It was only in January of this year, January 2014, that I attended a grief recovery workshop to become a certified grief recovery counselor. And I went upon the recommendation of somebody who posted on Facebook, a Facebook friend. And, and they suggested that it might improve my delivery. And at the time, my delivery certainly needed improved. Uh, I, was, I was taking the Spock-like, uber-rationalist approach. I'd show up at a presentation. I'd connect the dots for people, tell them that they're going to die and then walk out of the room. And there was no heart there. It was all left brain me. I was the medical doctor who, who comes into the examination room, checking his watch frequently, and tells the patient, it looks like you have maybe six weeks to live, and be sure to pay on your way out. I got a golf game to catch. Right. You know, it was just a horrible way. And so I went to this grief recovery workshop, and I discovered that, sure enough, I've been grieving. I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know what these feelings were, this, this feeling of, this painful feeling of having incomplete relationships with people because I hadn't completed the relationship because I was still stuck trying to trying to interact with people who knew the old me and wanted me to be the old me that it was no longer that that instead of moving on beyond those relationships I was stuck in the past of these relationships and what I really needed to do was reevaluate those relationships and in many cases complete those relationships, move on to a new relationship because everybody in my life, essentially everybody in my life abandoned me when I left the university in May of 2009. My colleagues immediately assumed I was insane and started looking for the reason for that because that's what academics do. Academics look for the, the reason behind the pattern. So the pattern is you're crazy. And so I heard from any number of people the question, what, what rare brain disease do you have exactly? Mm. And so for five and a half years, I didn't, I, I, I had these altered relationships and I didn't even know how to deal with that. The grief recovery workshop, which was intended for me to be a better presenter of my message turned out to be a way for me to complete those relationships that were incomplete, to move on beyond the people who, who thought and still think I'm crazy, to move on beyond those unfulfilling relationships from my past, and move into relationships like the ones I'm in now, where people understand what I'm going through at some level, and are willing to accept the message that I'm relaying that our lives are brief and therefore can be lived with urgency. Yeah. Thank you for opening up to us about this and sharing what it's like because we all 
those of us who decide to share this message, as I'm doing now as well, and many others, what's it feel like? And so I would like to hear the first time you actually gave a talk, a first public talk about abrupt climate change. Tell us about that. I think it was November 2012. And now you'd been writing about it now on a blog for several years at this stage. Yes, and I had, had realized we were in abrupt climate change in June of 2012. Right after that, I went on a speaking tour in New Zealand. And I didn't talk about it there. I blocked it out. It was weird in retrospect. I had reached the, I had re-reached the conclusion that we were done on June 20th, 2012. And so I wrote this essay about it. And then immediately thereafter, I went on this two week speaking tour in New Zealand and I never talked about it because I blocked it out. What were you talking about? I was talking about collapse of industrial civilization and how it's gonna save habitat for our species. So I'd realized at this point that it wouldn't save habitat for our species that were done regardless, but, but I hadn't integrated it within myself, and so I wasn't talking about it. It was bizarre when I look back upon it. And then I didn't have any speaking tours for quite a long time because people didn't want to hear what I had to say. The, the new me was pretty unpalatable. And I think it was in November that, that I actually gave my first presentation. It was the Bluegrass Bioneers conference in Louisville, Kentucky, and there was a guy recording on, on his phone, on his smartphone, recording the whole thing, and bits of it made it into Mike Sosby's film somewhere in New Mexico before the end of time. And it was kind of strange because this, this person who was recording, and, and I'm thankful to him for that, um, was, was hearing this stuff for the first time, and his response was to to laugh uproariously at inappropriate news, at inappropriate information. You know, so his his response was, I'm I'm telling this incredibly dire information, and he's bursting out laughing at it. And and then when he posted it on YouTube, he put it into the comedy into the category of comedy. Wow. By mistake. Wow. And so the 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 initial comments to that video are Oh my God! This is comedy. Are you insane? And, and so I think he changed the category, but and he apologized. Um, and he was. And there's still a bunch of comments there about him laughing at completely inappropriate times, which, which he admitted that right. he was. And and so I was doing my my typical talk that has a bunch of humor in it, but he wasn't laughing at those times. He was laughing at inappropriate times and also laughing at the appropriate times. He was just sort of overcome with these emotions. And so it was, a, it was a very interesting experience. There were a hundred or so people in the audience. At that point we had triggered, I believe, five self-reinforcing feedback loops. Right. And we're up around 40 now that we know about from the literature. And so at the Bluegrass Bioneers, November 2012, and I made this big switch to doing almost anything anybody would ask me to do. I'm trying to throw off the shackles of culture. And so this couple who are car free in Louisville pick me up at the airport on bicycles. They, they bring a third bicycle on a bicycle trailer. So here it is, it's almost midnight. It's November, it's pretty cool, it's raining, and I'm on a bicycle for maybe the third time in 35 years, and riding for half hour, hour to their house. It was a long way in any event. And so, so I started throwing off the shackles at that point. And, and later, it was a little over a year ago now, I guess, I was hosted in Hollywood, and I show up at the, at the home of my hostess, and the guy who picked me up to the airport, they've never met, even though they're they're both in the in the film industry, they they both do acting kind of work, and so he picks me up. They've never met. They're they're invi involved in a time bank, and he's paying into the time bank by picking me up, and she's extracting time out of the time bank, paying with time. And so Zach picks me up. We get to Catherine's house, and we're not there five minutes. We just barely have to say the introductions, and she says, "Oh, look around, try to find something to wear. We're going to a party tonight." And Zach and I look mm -hmm. at each other like, you know, I think we look pretty snappy for going to a party. And she says, oh, no, no, it's a no-clothes party. What? Welcome to Hollywood. We're going to a no-clothes party? She <laughs> said, you can wear anything. It's decent. You can wear anything. It just can't be clothes. So I show up to this party in Hollywood. 
you know, a few hours after arriving there, and I'm, I'm wearing a bamboo beach mat held up with, a, with an inner tube from a bicycle tire, and I have a, a, a paint roller for a sheath to put my wine bottle in, and a, a bicycle seat cover for a hat, looked like a beret. I thought it was pretty snazzy. And as I'm walking to the place, it it's must be a mile from where we park. It's a long way anyway. And I'm thinking, I don't have a wallet. I don't have any form of identification. I don't have a cell phone. If the cops come pick me up now for being a not properly clothed, for, for lewd behavior, I, got no, I can't even call anybody. <laughs> what am I going to do? And, Living on the edge with right, Guy McPherson. And more shackles are coming off, right? And so now um, I'm, I'm really willing to do just about anything, as absurd as it seems, because I recognize how absurd this whole thing is. The absurdity of the human existence, the absurdity of this culture in which we're embedded, the absurdity of abrupt climate change. So why not? Why not throw myself out there and do these things that I previously would not have considered, that I would have considered a little too strange for me, because I'm an upright, uptight college professor, right? Not anymore. Throwing off those shackles. Moving on. Yeah, so then you're getting emails uh, of people that, some positive, I'm sure, but a lot negative also, and then you start giving talks and getting reactions. Tell us what it's like to, to feel into the positive and the negative responses. Well, of course, initially, it was all horrible. And, but you like that. And most of it remains pretty <laughs> horrible. And it, it wears on me after a while. You know, I, I, I keep the hate mail to remind me that being humble is a good thing. And all I have to do is read one or two of these hate mail messages that go way back now. And it's a humbling experience. I've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, moving to the homestead was one. And, and it was a big one, and it cost me continue, continuing to do the work I love with people I love. And so that was a terrible mistake. It's nice to be reminded of my mistakes. Most scientists, and, and, and certainly the prognostications I've made, a scientist in my position, I want to be wrong. Most scientists are eager to be proven wrong. But in the data and the models and the projections I've seen, I'm increasingly convinced that we don't have long on this planet in terms of industrial civilization and also in terms of our own species. I'd like to be wrong about that. So yeah, so I, I get some, some email that decent people probably wouldn't send to their, their mother or anybody else. And, and I get some wonderfully um, thoughtful, heartfelt well-intended messages as well uh, on the telephone or or via email in fact as we're sitting here I felt the buzz in in my cell phone and the, it's in vibration mode and so I checked it when we took a little break here and, and some guy I don't know called from Hawaii just to tell me that he loved me and he loved my work and he wanted to talk to me and I think that's because somebody posted a video within the last couple of days and it was from the classroom, and I gave out my cell phone number in the classroom. I wrote it on the board, oh. and she didn't edit it out. So now that video is going out there, and everybody in the world knows my cell phone number. Well, that's a beautiful <laughs> thing, though. You give your number at most of the talks. You give your number to people. Yes, and especially to students, because they're young people, and they haven't heard this before, and they're coming to grips with their own mortality, even as they're entering this most wonderful stage of their life. Right, which is that's what it means to be a college student is to experience new things and in, including wonder and awe and learn all these things about yourself and about other people, about really important things like who you are and what it means to be a human being and and what what human sexuality is all about. And so they're discovering all these new things and of course I'm gonna give them my telephone number because this is this is deep deeply impactful, meaningful information. If they want to talk about it, I want to talk about it. So good for them for giving me a call. Yeah, it's been really powerful. We've had several meetings at colleges where the teacher, professor will just say, I want you to come talk in my class. And to some degree, they prep the students and then they tell us roughly what they think their, you know, their student wisdom is, if you will. And then a lot of times we'll take a, we'll take a, a survey, you know, how many people are early in your process? How many have studied climate change a little bit to get a little bit of a feel? But many times 
the students at these universities and community colleges um, are very early in their study of climate change. That's right. They really don't know much. They, they might have checked in with Al Gore's movie and Inconvenient Truth several years ago, and, and that's kind of all they know, that if we, if we switch to squirrely light bulbs and hybrid cars, then 100 years from now, we're going to be at 1 degree C warming, and that's no big deal. Right. Or whatever. So we always tailor the talk to attempt to, to make it right for the people that are there, mm -hmm. but it always gets to that place of we're, we're in some pretty big trouble pretty quick, and so that's exciting for, for everyone. Yes, it's exciting for everyone. <laughs> I think that's the take-home message <laughs> that's here. That's the take-home message. There's message. excitement all around. Right. So, so we are creating another video called Climate 101 that will just introduce somebody to what climate change is and this general feeling that things aren't looking so good. Because as we begin to explore how to introduce this to other people, it's really powerful to be able to do that in a smooth way. They've got to be able to hear what they can hear. And then if they're interested to, to get more, they can get more and there'll be lots of videos to watch. So look for the Climate 101 uh, video for that. And, and again, speaking to the students has been so powerful and speaking well to all the different things has led us basically to a new perspective on this and a, and a new target for our work. And a new target for my work especially. Um, because, you know, when I started speaking about collapse of industrial civilization and climate change, that was one thing. And it was really sort of a light brushing on the climate change. And then it wasn't long after that I moved into abrupt climate change. Climate change that threatens our species with habitat, with, with an absence of habitat on this planet. And, and as I already indicated, that at that point I was the uh, heartless rationalist just presenting the information sort of guy and and so then I went to the grief recovery workshop immediately after that I went to a Dharma Center in Winnipeg hosted by a Lama and we did a series of meditations on death and dying and and that took me into a new place and now I'm trying to focus on that new place I think it'll take years for relatively mainstream climate scientists to catch up with the climate change information, with the abrupt climate change. And for me, that's, that's well behind me. Uh, I've moved on to what does this mean emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, if, if you want to use that word. What does it mean to us as humans, as human animals, societally and individually? What does it mean to be facing abrupt climate change that could lead to the absence of habitat for us all. What does that mean in, in my heart, in your heart? What does that mean for the way we interact with people in the future? Are we willing to interact with people and talk about the weather all the time? Make, make small talk in light of the urgency of our lives. Right, used to be talking about the weather was small talk and now talking about the weather has become the deepest topic. And, and I'll say in closing this segment that when we have these talks with folks and, and you sit down with them afterwards, there's an instant connection that happens where you're on the same page about things now. You're, all these shackles go away like you were talking about and there's a presence that we're, on, we're in this together in a whole different way. And the folks we've been meeting have been just priceless and the connection, the presence the richness and and just sitting with someone and saying how does this move through you and that's all you need to do and there it goes <laughs> and so whew, there's a lot more about that topic in the video that we did on the good grief uh, workshops so check into that one yeah this is this is whole new terrain and some people are open to it and are open to having these conversations and others not so much and that's okay yeah we're all gonna process this differently yeah. And, and, and so one of my taglines now is no guilt, no judgment. So let's not judge people for the way they're integrating the information or not integrating. So yeah, incredible work going on. Thank you for your incredible work and your incredible courage to share this message and to tell us what it, a little bit about what it's been like to, to move into the different stages and to, to dare to be that messenger that you are and to dare to invite other people to be the messenger too. And I guess that's the purpose of these videos is to assist you in feeling into it and then to invite you to see what this brings up in you. And if you're drawn to share this message that perhaps some of these talks can help you share the message too. 
All right, thank you, of course, for setting up this whole thing, which has taken my work to a, to a new and I think much deeper level than it was at not very long ago. Yeah, thank you, and watch some of the other videos to get depth on the, the grief work in particular and, and all the other stuff. Mm -hmm.